I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like. Well, it's from Matthew chapter 13, part of verse 31. You know, God ever so often has to correct us. He has to correct our misconceptions about who he is, what he is about. Our misconceptions about the kingdom of God. And in the gospel today, we find such an occasion. Once again, Jesus finds himself correcting the disciples' perception of what the kingdom of God is really all about. No one could mistake the fact that God was doing something in Jesus. Something impressive, something powerful, something worth paying attention to. Something worth leaving everything behind to get on board with. But as the disciples observed him in action, we find that they were focusing on the wrong thing. They were focusing on the miraculous and what God could do for them in this kingdom. They were focusing on being the greatest and what was big and apparent about Jesus and this new kingdom that he was preaching and teaching about. Amy Richter, priest in the Episcopal Church, says they missed the point. They missed the point about this kingdom, about their own need for humility, their own need to pay attention to the least and to the small in God's kingdom. See, they had pushed little children away and had argued over who should sit at the right hand and who should sit at the left hand of God in this coming kingdom. And as such, they were in danger of becoming ladder climbers instead of kingdom seekers. Jesus needed to correct that perception because that's not what the kingdom of God is about. And as we reflect on this text, I wonder, dear friends, where in your life is God correcting you? What misconceptions do you have about his kingdom, about what he should be doing for you and in your life? Where is he helping you to refocus believe this parable calls us to pay attention to that. But also in correcting the disciples, we notice that Jesus used a series of parables as found in the gospel today. And he uses these parables in a powerful way to remind them, indeed all of us who sometimes get distracted and who focus on the wrong thing in God's kingdom and ministry, that this kingdom is about faithfulness, not flashiness. It is about seeking people, not positions. It is about transformation and not transactional service. The mentality that I scratch your back, so you scratch mine. The mentality that Jesus, I'm only in this to see what I can get out of it. No, God's kingdom, dear friends, is about service. It is about seeking the lost, the overlooked, the invisible, the buried. It's not about showiness. The parables evidence this for us. They tell us exactly what the kingdom of God looks like. And so let me share a few of them with you. And the first parable compares the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, that which is small but grows tremendously, and to yeast in flour. And it reminds us that the kingdom of God is about influence. It is about transformation. That this kingdom, when it is within us, raises us to be all that God has created us to be. We can say of this kingdom, you raise me up. You transform me. And so the obvious question for us is, are we being transformed by this kingdom? Are we still seeking Things that cannot satisfy. Are we being transformed? See, we are not meant to miss the fact that in this comparison, this metaphor of the mustard seed, Jesus says that the seed was intentionally sown. In other words, we have to be intentional about seeking transformation by planting seeds daily in Bible study and prayer and the like. 
And this is not to make the transformation that occurs within us sound as if it is our ability to transform ourselves. No, we know that God does the transformation. But what it is saying is that we have to intentionally make ourselves available to God. We must open ourselves by doing the things that can allow and help God to reach us within. In the mustard seed and yeast in dough comparison, Jesus is asking us several simple questions. How is the kingdom of God influencing us? How are we as Christians, how are we as Christians influencing the world out there? And it is here that the yeast comparison, I believe, goes just a little deeper. Because we know from history that the Jews ate unleavened bread. That is bread without yeast during the Passover. And if you've ever eaten bread without yeast, it's not the best tasting bread, right? It's not. But they ate leavened bread every other day. What does that mean here when Jesus makes that comparison? It seems as though Jesus was making the point that the kingdom of heaven being compared to yeast in a dough is not only found in the religious things of life, but also in the ordinary, everyday activity of life. Yeast in the dough. Yes, every day we live out this kingdom. And so, for example... How do you go about cleaning your house? Is it always with complaints? These children always leaving things about the place. Why wouldn't my spouse pick up things? Or how is this? Or is it with thanksgiving? Thanksgiving that you have a house to clean. That you have a house in which there is dirt. No, 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 no that came out wrong. A house in which there is dirt to clean, right? <laughs> but the point is, Living our Christian lives is not just a Sunday activity. It's an everyday activity. The kingdom is to be lived out every day. Not only when we are on the vestry or attending church on Sunday or on a committee in the church. And we can ask ourselves where we fall on this scale by just asking several questions, reflecting. Do I think about God more when I'm here in church? Or is he a part of my thoughts in everyday life? Do I think about God only when I'm really doing religious activities? Or is he infused? Is his spirit permeating everything that I do? Sunday service is simply meant to be a token of what we offer God each and every day of our lives. And this parable challenges us to allow God's kingdom to influence every nook and cranny of our lives. Are we open to that? Yes, Jesus goes on then to compare the kingdom to a merchant finding a pearl. And he is admonishing us that in this kingdom, there is sacrifice. It brings great joy, but it also calls us to let go. You know, in some, in other words, the kingdom is worth far more than anything else we may possess. Now, sometimes we can be like Little Tyler, who this morning when they said the kingdom is worth everything. And I said, well, what is your greatest toy? And he said, it is a remote control car. And I said, well, if the kingdom is worth everything, will you be willing to give that car to Father Mario and pursue the kingdom of God? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly the kingdom didn't mean everything to him. You know, what Jesus is saying to us is that this kingdom calls us to make it a priority, to make God a priority in our lives. And that's why Paul said, I count everything as loss when I came to know Jesus. Everything else was secondary. What is your greatest possession, friends? What is it that you long for more than anything else in life? What are you searching for? Peace? Contentment? Fame, fortune, happiness, success. See, none of these things can ultimately fill that longing. It's my Christian belief that only God can. Our hearts were made for you, O God, and they will not rest until they rest in you. St. Augustine. So what is the best thing in life? This parable tells us it's God's kingdom, the source of true joy. The man was so overjoyed, he sold everything. 
See, who doesn't long for that joy deep within? And yet, how unreliable do we find the things in this world to bring joy? Get a new house, it brings joy for a little while. A new car, joy for a little while. All of these things, once the novelty wears off, the joy goes away. And here's what Jesus is saying. Lasting, true, unspeakable joy comes from God and being a part of his kingdom. Not happiness, because that's circumstantial, right? But true inner peace. Because we know that peace with God is not the absence of conflict. It's not the absence of trials and tribulations in our world. But as my grandmother used to say, with Christ in the vessel, you could smile at the storm. That's the kind of peace. You can still go through it knowing that though we walk through the valley and the shadows of death, we ought to fear no evil because God is with us. And his rod and his staff, oh yes. They'll comfort us through it all. So what Jesus is telling us is that the joy we experience in the kingdom will surprise us because it is joy unspeakable. Does not remove the problems of this world, but it does give us the strength and makes the problems of our world more manageable and the experiences of life much richer. Nothing can take this joy away. And so as Jesus corrects our understanding of the kingdom, that it ought to be influencing our daily activities and we ought to be influencing the world, that there is nothing to compare to this joy that the kingdom offers, he also offers us comfort. He realizes that sometimes we are not exactly where we should be or where God wants us to be. And so he speaks of the kingdom that catches fish of all kinds and throws away the bad. And here's the point, that even if there is a time in your life that you feel you don't live up to the standards of God or what God expects of us, his kingdom is open to all. It's ours for the taking. That beautiful, beautiful scripture of John 3.16 reminds us that God so loved this world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him, not if the rich, not if the transformed, not if the good, but whoever will not perish. And we must take comfort in the fact that God did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world. See, that's the verse that's often missed right after John 3.16. Remember that in God's kingdom, there is no discrimination. And sometimes... We think that because of the things we do, because we don't allow the kingdom to influence us in ways that it should all the time, that somehow God doesn't want anything to do with us. No, that's not God's kingdom. That's not what he teaches. He welcomes all. He calls all. But he also calls us in like fish to scale and clean us. We may not be where God wants us to be, but we must be willing to change. We must be open to becoming who God wants us to be. And when we struggle with making changes, when we think that the little things we're doing doesn't seem as if they matter, hear what this parable tells us. See, because I've often heard that being good, Mario, sometimes just don't cut it. How many times, you know, Peter struggled with it. Must I forgive? I don't know if I really love these individuals, if it's going to change them. Why must I always be the Christian? Why must I always do the right thing? Well, here's why. Because the separation of the fish, the good and the bad, is a reminder that when all is said and done, God's kingdom will prevail. The good we do, the right thing, sometimes seems insignificant, sometimes seems to go unnoticed, but it is like the mustard seed. It is like the mustard seed, though invisible at times, will eventually grow, it will eventually spread, and will eventually stand tall above everything else. Good will prevail. Every wrong will be made right. Justice will be served. That's our inspiration to keep doing good. Sometimes, sometimes, 
it seems insignificant as if it doesn't matter. But doing the right thing, seeking God's kingdom, trying to be who God has called us to be, always matters. And someday, the smell of baking bread will permeate the city because the yeast will raise the dough. And someday the treasure will be unearthed and the pearl, your good, will be seen by all. And someday the fish will be separated. And that's comforting and that's good to know. And so yes, let the kingdom influence you. And you influence the world with your goodness and your love for God and for others. And though others may not always recognize it, don't be sidetracked. Don't lose focus about what this kingdom is all about. Don't get sidetracked about the flashiness and the showiness. Don't get sidetracked about what doesn't seem to be happening. Just keep on doing what God has called you to do. And as we just sang, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And know that all things will be added unto you. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Amen.